through the book of Micah. We're going to look at Micah, and then we're going to come from Micah to the Lord's Supper to uh, understand a couple of things. Now, Micah is one of those books that we don't look at very much. In fact, you could turn to uh, Micah. Most of you know a verse from Micah. You know it almost by heart, and it's Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth. For me to be ruler in Israel, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Micah writes that in about 700 or so B.C., and then Jesus is born 700 years later uh, in Bethlehem. But that's not the only thing that's in Micah, so if you go to, to that verse, the, the Christmas, the prophecy of Christmas, and then back up a chapter, you'll actually find where we are today in Micah chapter 4, and we're going to look at a few verses here, Micah writes to the people of Israel, and it's important to understand what they're dealing with. The people of Israel have split into two nations. You have a northern kingdom called Israel and a southern kingdom called Judah. And the northern kingdom has been hauled away into captivity. Now to put that in perspective, think about how you would feel if Missouri had been conquered and hauled off into captivity. Now, I know some of you don't really like Missouri, and it wouldn't bother you that much, but if the army that had just conquered them was now looking at the Arkansas border and thinking about crossing it, maybe the fate of Missouri wouldn't be that, that stressful to you, but the fact that the fate, same fate could befall us in Arkansas, that would be a problem. Micah prophesies in the southern kingdom of Judah, but as he's <coughs> prophesying down there, this, that's what's happened. The Assyrians have come and they have captured and basically destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. They've hauled the people off into captivity. And the Assyrians, fighting the Assyrians, looks like a very much a lost cause. In the same way that as football season dawns upon us, the thought of you know, Stuttgart High School facing the University of Alabama would seem like a lost cause. The nation of Judah had about that kind of relative strength. They didn't have enough to fight the Assyrians. For every hundred men the Assyrians could feel, could put on in the battle to attack Judah, the, Ju the folks of Judah could probably put five in defense. They just didn't have the numbers. They also didn't have the technology. There were all sorts of ways in which it was just a bad idea. So the people of Judah are very concerned. But the biggest problem that they have is that the people of Judah have for so long been wishy-washy about their faith and their commitment to the Lord that they can't rely on the covenant of God that they have relied on for so long because they've not held up their end and God made them conditional promises that if they would be obedient, He would keep them saved. And they haven't been obedient. And Michael warns them, because of your disobedience, God is not going to stop outside forces from bringing problems upon you. But then we look, and leading up to this, where we are in Micah chapter 4, beginning with verse 6, leading up to this, Micah has warned them that they're going to be conquered, that they're going to face these invading armies. But then Micah chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, in that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. As for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come. Even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you, or has your counselor perished? That agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth? Ride and labor to give birth, daughter of Zion, like a woman in childbirth. For now you will go out of, out of the city, dwell in the field, and go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. This is a twofold prophecy from Micah. And the first is fulfilled some 200 years later because the people of the southern kingdom were called into captivity by the Babylonians. And then God delivers them from that captivity back to Jerusalem. But he speaks about the lame and how he'll take the lame remnant and the outcast and make them into a nation. And understand this. When these invading armies would come in and conquer, the lame are the people they'd leave behind. The folks who were too weak, too wounded, too useless to do anything with, 
sometimes perhaps too old, the young they could raise up to be slaves or to raise up to be faithful to the invading kingdom, but the older folks, they just leave them behind and let them starve to death. The lame, the wounded in battle, those who weren't worth taking into the new kingdom would just be left behind and left to die. And Micah says, the word of the Lord is this. God says, I'll take the lame and the outcast and I will assemble them into a great nation. I will take those who aren't worth having and put them together and they will be my kingdom. It says that I will redeem them, I will assemble them, and I will rescue them. I will bring them back and make them into my people. Now when this happens, it's not when he brings the people back from the nation, from the nation of Babylon and the Persians let them come back. They come back. They're not the lame and the outcasts. In fact, they're some of the leaders of, of the nation. Go, go on down and read Ezra and Nehemiah. These people were not the lame and the outcasts. We see this fulfilled instead when we see Jesus stand before the synagogue in Nazareth and say, Today, the scripture says, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing that the lame and the poor will have the good news preached to them. The broken hearts will be bound up. And he says, this is the new covenant. Now, where we are today is this. Many of us are afraid to admit and unwilling to admit that we're the lame and the outcasts. We're unable to let our egos break a little bit. And come before God and say, you know, without you, I really don't have anything. We've been raised to be strong, self-sufficient people. We've been committed even as a group of people, whether it be as Americans, as Arkansans, as Almirans, and even as a good Baptist church, we have thought of ourselves as strong. We think of ourselves as the center of the community. We're in an important place, and we are physically pretty much in the center of town. But what we need to understand is that until we come to the point that we come before the Lord and admit that we are the lame, that we are the outcasts that, that don't have a place that we fit apart from being with Him, that we'll never get anywhere. As long as we continue to try to say, no, we can do this ourselves, then all we'll ever succeed at is the things that we're actually capable of. But there are many things that we're not capable of. We can't save ourselves from our sins. Every one of us are born condemned, separated from God. Why? Because it's been passed on to us all the way down our family lineage. And no, I'm not talking bad about your mother. I'm talking about the way we are as human beings. And we need to be made whole by God. We can't do that on our own. It took Jesus coming and dying on the cross, rising again the third day to be able to heal us and rescue us from our sins. We can't make our relationships right with one another because we get agitated and that sinful nature just kicks back and causes us to have tension and stress. And even more than that, we can't accomplish standing for the kingdom of God on our own. Not when we're trying to build our own kingdoms and do our own things, create our own little niche in this world that we fit into. We need to understand that our purpose here is to serve the Lord. Our purpose here, even if we are cast out by society, is to accept that God has made us a people. Whoever else may reject us, whoever else may dislike us, whoever else may cause us problems and difficulties, 
we are accepted by the king of the universe, by the creator of all that we see. And so when somebody rejects you because they don't like you, maybe they decided they don't like people with gray hair, maybe they decided they don't like poor people, they don't like tall people. Maybe they decided they didn't like people who wore glasses. All these things that happen, the Lord is the one who has said whether or not we're accepted. We need to stop seeking our acceptance in other people and recognize that our acceptance is because God makes us for it. But our pride stands in the way of that so much. Our pride that tells us that we don't need help. Our pride that tells us that we are strong. Our pride that tells us that we're too important to serve. And then we come to a reminder of the covenant and a reminder of the cross. We come and, have, and need to realize that it was Jesus, it was the Lord himself, who, though he was in the very nature of God, decided that it, equality was God, with God was not something to be held on to, but instead emptied himself and took the form of a servant and was obedient, even unto death, and that death on the cross where his body was broken for our sin and his blood was spilled for us. And because of that, God has exalted him to the highest place that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we come this morning to something that was revolutionary when it first began. Because Jesus took the bread and the cup of the Passover meal of the Jews and said, this isn't about getting out of slavery in Egypt. It's about my death on the cross for your sins. And then when the church took it on and began to do it, they, it was a reminder of what Jesus had done for their sins. And it was a proclamation that Caesar, though he had the power of life and death over every person in the Roman Empire and all of them at the time lived in the Roman Empire. That Caesar, who could walk down the street and say, you I don't like anymore, we'll have you executed. Caesar, who could walk down the street and say, you, you that owns that, that building over there, I want the building, you have to give it to me. Caesar, who could walk down the street and demand that everybody bow to the ground and proclaim that Caesar is Lord, he is in charge of all things, that in fact Caesar was wrong. We come to proclaim that Christ is Lord. That Jesus is the one who rules over all things, and most especially that he rules over us. We come not to satisfy a physical hunger. As good as the bread may be, as good, much as you may like, a little cup of juice. We don't come to satisfy a, spirit, a physical hunger. We come because we are spiritually hungry. And we need to be reminded of the bread of life that makes us alive. And that is why we come today. We come together because Jesus didn't just die for you. He died for you, 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 all of us. He died for his people. And while, yes, he would have come just for you, he didn't. He died on the cross for all the redeemed of all the age. And so we come together to remember that. We come to remember the cost of our sin. And so before we come to do that, it's, worthy. it's a worthwhile part of our time to take a few moments to examine our hearts for that sin. It's worth a few moments of our time to consider where we are in our obedience. Because before we come and do this, we need to check 
and consider what's in our hearts. Consider what areas that we're holding back that God has said, this is what you ought to do. Maybe there's a sin in your life that you haven't confessed, repented from, and aren't striving to get away from. Maybe there's a step of positive obedience, something that God has commanded that you ought to do, that you keep refusing to do. Maybe it's something you see, think that you're not worthy of, and yet God has said, I take the lame and the outcast and make them a people. Maybe it's something that you're afraid to do because you don't know what other people are going to think as you walk in obedience to the Lord, but you need to step up and do it. Maybe it's just making a public declaration of your faith in Christ and being willing to obey in baptism. Whatever it is, we're going to take a few moments in prayer to consider where we are, and then we'll come to the table. So let's, would you join me for a few moments as we pray? Father, we come to you this morning. We desire to open our hearts and be cleaned by you. We desire, Lord, as a church family, to walk well in obedience to you. So we ask you to help us to repent. Help us to walk well with you. And Lord, we pray that as we come to this time together, you will help us make this a declaration of our faith in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come and as our deacons come to help serve, so come on, deacon or two or three or four, however many we got. Uh, as our deacons come to help serve, we come to this time.